I'm happy to introduce our moderator, Raymond Franken, financial journalist, and he will introduce his panel. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, and uh, thank you very much for SLB and ECB for hosting this event, which I think it's the right moment, of course, 10 years after the introduction of Banking Union to take stock of where we are. In this panel, I hope we can elucidate you as audience on uh, the operational resilience aspects and the challenges and opportunities that are still in there. The panel here is with Elena Carletti. She is a Professor of Finance at Bocconi University and also Chair of the uh, Internal Controls and Risk Committee at uh, Unicredit, uh, Italy's biggest bank, and that's a non-executive independent uh, director role. Next to her, Christian Ossig, Chair of the Bankenverband, the German Banking Association, and the President, uh, sorry, the uh, Chair of the Executive Committee of the European Banking Federation. And next to me is Fernando Restoy, Chair of the Financial Stability Institute at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. The institute was created, I believe, in 1997 after the Asian crisis, uh, according to your website. And of course, we'll be joined online from New York by Elizabeth McCall, member of the supervisory board uh, at the European Central Bank. Elizabeth, good morning to you. Very early in New York, we understand. Good morning. Good morning. Thank good morning. you. Good morning. Yes. Before we start with the actual discussion, let's run a quick audience poll. Let's see what you as, uh, as, as viewers, as audience, is actually believing uh, are the most biggest risks in terms of uh, uh, resilience. What are the, the, the chapters that you actually have uh, identified? We'll be discussing some of those. Of course, there are aspects like uh, uh, the current framework, uh, banking union, also technology and cybersecurity, and uh, big tech as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a something that banks are increasingly reliant on. And of course, emerging risks in the economic context that we are seeing at the moment, also with inflation and the, the context provided by the Ukraine war. So if you go to Mentimeter, you can answer uh, the questions and see, uh, let us know actually what you believe are the, uh, uh, the, 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 the most challenging aspects and the most uh, biggest opportunities. Climate change is also uh, among one of them. Uh, the ECB in the last few days actually ran a similar poll on Twitter, and the outcome of that one was actually that credit risk is seen as the, the biggest challenge uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the area of operational resilience, next to bank profitability and cybersecurity. Now let's start the uh, actual discussions uh, over here. Uh, Elizabeth, let's first come to you. You've been uh, uh, very much working on the, the current framework that, that is in place. Um, you have defined the number of supervisory priorities. Um, is the framework doing what it was supposed to do? Thank you, um, and very interesting poll. I, I, I agree with um, some of the information that you've already put forward. Um, and thank you for allowing me to join you uh, virtually today. I had a personal family issue that has kept me from being with you. Um, in terms of the supervisory priorities, we have a, a very important process at the ECB where we um, really spend time internally in each, each of our business areas. We spend time with the supervisory board. We spend time with each of the national competent authorities. And we gather, um, maybe, it's, maybe it's right to use the word of polling, process where we, we really try to put our finger on where the where the risks are in the system and where we should be dedicating our resources in terms of our overall supervisory priorities. Um, it's something that we do annually, but we have a forward look for, for a three-year period of time. Um, interestingly, we just are going through the process in this week to check ourselves with the work that we did last year. And last year, when we put our priorities together for that three-year horizon, we really had three things that we focused in on. The first was making sure that banks emerge from the pandemic healthy. And here, um, our big focus is really on credit risk and what's happening on the balance sheet of the banks. Um, the second is, um, are the structural challenges that were there in the system even before the pandemic, are these structural challenges being managed? Are they being met? You know, when we went into the pandemic, we had certain issues with the banking institutions, such as sustainability of the business models and the profitability, ongoing profitability of the banks. And the third uh, real area is, is um, 
emerging risks. Um, which emerging risks are out there and that we need to be taking account of? And here we focus in on cybersecurity risk, the interconnectedness of the market and the interest rate, rising interest rate environment that we're in, the kinds of things that can happen um, to the institutions as a result of the changing market environment. Um, so these three areas, we tested ourselves and said, um, you know, as we began to emerge from the, from the pandemic, of course, um, and appallingly, uh, we are facing the war uh, uh, in Ukraine. And, um, you know, this has had, of course, um, you know, tremendous effect on, on lives of people. And it's something that um, we, 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 pray, we pray for peace. Um, it is also having uh, a tremendous effect on the overall marketplace. And so did this event, an ongoing event, has it changed our focus on supervisory priorities? In fact, it really underscored that the priorities we selected last year um, remain quite relevant. And in some ways, it made some of these priorities that we established even more relevant. For example, um, you know, having a look at the changing interest rate environment, we're continuing to operate in, a, in an overall market environment that is experiencing a series of supply shocks and rising uh, costs of food and commodities, which will have an impact on balance sheets and borrowing, et cetera. Um, it also underscores the need uh, for our banks to be focused in on cybersecurity risks, for example. Um, we, it raises concerns that there may be um, increasing cyber attacks that we may see down the road. So um, yes, uh, the answer to your question is, um, you know, we're, we're very focused on the supervisory priorities. Um, we've validated that and made some uh, slight changes in emphasis just this week in the supervisory board. And um, we're hard at work with our staff on making sure that we follow through on these in our supervisory program. Liz, before we go into the rest of the panel, one specific question on the lessons learned. If there's one single biggest lesson that, that the ECB has learned in, in terms of working with these priorities, what is it? I think uh, that's a great question. Um, the biggest lesson is that you should have a short view and a longer view, and uh, not something that you just do annually with a blank sheet of paper. Um, and why do I say that? Um, you know, the, the risk horizon is, of course, constantly changing, um, but it is not the case that you can deploy your resources uh, to a changing environment for every single thing that you're doing on an annual basis. You have to have some continuity in the way that you are viewing the institutions um, while also retaining an agility, a nimbleness to shift as the markets shift. So I think the, the biggest lesson learned is to have a, a long-term, a three-year horizon that we can operate in and not just a, a single annual program. Some of the things that we need to be doing need to be done on a longer term basis. Thank you, Liz. Let's move to the Bank for International Settlements, to Fernando. You've in the past criticized uh, the, the, the European structure for supervision for uh, resolution uh, and identified in, in one of your studies very significant shortcomings. Uh, that was a few years ago. Uh, do you still see those shortcomings in the way it is implemented today? Okay, okay this is obviously a topic which is central to many of the discussions that we have, we have had on in this conference and in many other conferences and gatherings over the last uh, few years, right? I think it's clear that uh, the banking union was created not with a sort of wonderful ideological political motivation to try to foster additional European integration. Of course, it does contribute to European, European integration, but it was a defensive move and we have actually to keep that in, that in mind. I mean, we, wanted badly to break this awfully perverse bit battle loop between you know, sovereign risk and, ban um, and banking risk. That was needed. And that was the main motivation of the banking union when this was created. Uh, what we put in place is a fully effective, well-functioning banking union with a single supervisory mechanism, applying high homogeneous supervisory standards to all significant institutions in the, in the currency union, we have a well-functioning single, single resolution uh, mechanism that basically allows the 
resolution of, say, significant banks, basically following common procedures, pretty much aligned with international standards on the matter, and also, uh, and also with the ability of making use of European funds, European fully mutualized uh, funds, like a single resolution mechanisms. So we have actually gone a long way in terms of uh, sort of putting in place and developing this banking, banking union concept, and therefore we have, done, they have gone somewhere in terms of trying to reduce actually the chances for those uh, perverse feedback loops. But the fact uh, is that we are not yet there. Mm. This is clear. This is clear uh, from the Eurogroup meeting last week. I mean, certainly there is no clear progress in completing the banking union. Uh, we don't have any prospect, reasonable prospect, to have a European deposit insurance scheme in the forthcoming future. And what we have is some, basically some, well, uh, roadmap in the direction of trying to improve the crisis management framework. And this is uh, relatively, relatively unfortunate because in, for the banking unit to make a good job in trying to you know, mitigate sufficiently the risk of this feedback loop, uh, perverse feedback loop, we really need the whole thing. We need actually single supervisory mechanism. We have a single resolution mechanism, but also we need actually a European deposit insurance scheme. On the top of that, certainly we have to improve the crisis management framework. It does not work properly. So right now, it's really a fact that most of the banking crisis in the European Union will not be actually handled by the single resolution mechanism. We have to still rely on national mechanisms, national procedures, national rules, and we have to rely on national money. Again, it's something that goes against the very objectives of the currency of the currency union, and the same is true actually with respect to uh, integration. I, mean, I think it's a key part of the of the equation as well. I mean, if we really want actually to sort of denationalize banks' risk, we need actually banks to be less national, becoming more European. So we need more pan-European banks, whether well, large or small. We need well, we need them to be pan-European, and we have not made progress on that either. So whether you look at cross-border transactions, mergers and acquisitions, again, banks in Europe remain national. And this has to do with a number of things. Hmm? It has to do with the structure of the banking industry in Europe, particularly in some large jurisdictions. It has to do with a number of elements there. But regulation is also important. The reinfencing issue is there. That reduces incentives for banks to expand their businesses to other European countries. And this, again, this does not contribute actually to, to, to the ultimate goal eh, to provide sort of robustness to the European integration, European integration uh, project. We, so we certainly actually need uh, progress in those domains. Let's see if uh, we manage actually to do it. But I'm afraid we don't have much time to waste eh, on that. And the signs of fragmentation that we are observing in pallidate markets recently, well, sort of is maybe it's a signal that, uh, again, we may not have that time, actually much time, in order to complete the job that we initiated. Eh? Christian, question for you. The, as part of banking union, we have uh, also a, a single resolution fund. By the end of 2024, banks will have placed 80 billion euros into that fund under supervision by the SRB. Um, that's a commitment from the banking sector that uh, they are contributing. When you then see the decision in Luxembourg last week by the Eurogroup ministers on banking union uh, on going backwards or not making any progress on uh, the deposit insurance system. How does that make the banking sector feel? Thank you, Omar. And let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. And usually that's kind of a polite sense that you say in the beginning, but I would like to combine that with a message. And that is clearly the banking industry supervisors, head of, say, of, of resolution mechanism. We do not agree on all points, but it has to be said that the exchange of views, the dialogue, that works extremely well, that is of high quality, and that is important in times of crisis, not only today, but also throughout the last years. So that is something positive I would like to start with. And if you allow one short personal note, Ella and myself, we go back a long time, over 20 years. Right. And over 20 years ago, we were affiliated to the Center for Financial Studies in Frankfurt. We would sit there in the audience, and we would follow a debate like that with great interest. And it's fun to kind of change perspective and to sit today here on the other side. Yes. Um, the, the question you asked, Fernando, kind of um, 
single resolution mechanism, um, where do we stand? And first of all, I think it has to be acknowledged that the SRB has done a great job in setting up that institution, building it, finding its place in the European supervisory landscape. And yet, you were asking about the funds that the SRB has collected. Having that single resolution mechanism, no question there is a need for a resolution mechanism. We have to ask whether costs and benefits are in balance. And I think you even mentioned the numbers. There are now 80 billion in the single resolution fund. That takes a lot of financial substance away from the banking sector. And especially in these times where it's all about investment, providing funding for clients, you can ask whether Europe has gotten the balance right between collecting funds for a safety net and not harming too much banks' ability to provide funding. That, that, that is a question, needless to say, I have a view on that, and some people here in the room have a different view on that. And that is something I said at the beginning, we discuss very frequently and very lively. Um, and the other point you brought up is banking union. Um, I would like to start by saying that last week, from my perspective, and I'm speaking here for the European banking sector, that was a very bad day for Europe. It was not a surprising day. What we have seen there did not really come as a surprise, and yet it was a bad day, and it's a disappointment. Um, why do I say that that clearly? And I'm less about deposit insurance, the point you mentioned, and I'm less going on about risk weight of sovereign bonds or crisis management, these three or four buckets that were discussed there. When I say it was a bad day and it's a disappointing day for Europe, I'm referring to the total lack of progress in terms of market integration. If we talk about banking union, for me, it should not be so much about EDIS. I understand that for some member states, it is a necessity to move on with market integration. That is, even having a German head on, as far as the private banks are concerned, I'm willing to compromise on EDIS. We don't need that. I'm not enthusiastic about it. But I see that there is a need to get done with it in order to progress in terms of market integration. Um, well, make a long story short, no surprise, in, in Donoghue's work and projects, there was already weeks before the final meeting clear that there was not much on the table left in terms of market integration. That is very bad for Europe. Um, we commissioned a study with Copenhagen Economics a couple of years ago. The benefits to really integrate European financial markets would be in the range of 100 billion per year. We talk about huge um, benefits that we do not realize. Now, how did this poor result come about of the Eurogroup there? Kind of we, 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 we followed that all very closely. Germany was really focusing very much on getting as exceptions for institutional protection schemes. Now, if you ask me if we want to have a level playing field, we cannot expect to exclude 20% of European deposits from a European deposit insurance, that does not work. We need to have less national options and discretions, less exceptions like do not touch on our institution protection schemes. Um, Germany has invested a lot of political capital on the question of risk weighting of sovereign bonds. Here you have a German position, you have an Italian position for Italy, risk weight of sovereign bonds is complicated from the opposite perspective than from the German ones. Crisis management, especially for Italy, is a difficult topic. And, um, and I guess if I look at it from a French bank's perspective, I mentioned it, the pillar two of banking union, hugely costly, not really a success story from the perspective especially of large French banks. Um, I could say the same for large German banks. Um, the appetite to have a third pillar is very muted. Um, so bottom line, we have the result that we have, and that's clearly not a good result for Europe. Elena, we heard Johan Thijs at KBC mention that uh, banks are, his bank is required to report 6,000 reports to the supervisors uh, as a result of banking union. We have the significant uh, uh, contributions to the resolution fund. 
Is banking union asking too much from the banking sector? Well, first of all, good morning to everybody. And let me say, I'm speaking on my personal capacity, so I'm not here to do any advocacy or anything. Just as a, a privilege, if you want, observers of also what's going on inside the banks. And let me say, I mean, the number of reports that the banks produce for supervisor is indeed very high. And I think also part of it, what I think is a little bit frustrating is a part of the regulatory requirement are really a little bit of a nature of ticks the box exercises, where I think, and this should not distract our attention, if you want, uh, from the more core topics and issues that we should be focusing on. So rather than producing a lot of reports, I think what, what indeed I think it would be very useful is to concentrate on topics like scenario analysis, in particular in this current moment. What are the scenarios that we need to build? What are the scenarios that we have both for ICAB exercises on which supervisor base a lot of decisions? And as far as I understand, they are completely decentralized in a way they're not uniform across banks from exercises more like stress tests where scenarios are instead given. But these, I think, are topics that we should be focusing much more and also where the governance body should focus much more. Another aspect is now we have in the mid-reviews, we have the uh, update of the scenario for the FSR 9. That's also another topic on which I think banks should be very concentrated because this is the first time where possibly we are going to see changes in the way banks are incorporating the new shocks uh, and the new situation with the Ukraine situation. And in terms of banking union, I mean, Christian said that he and I date back 20 years ago, but I think the banking union debates date indeed 10 years. And yesterday, I was a bit frustrated, I think, as everybody else, to see that it was exactly the same discussion we were having 10 years ago. I think uh, uh, Sean Bergen yesterday mentioned, no, but between the risk sharing and risk reduction, we are not there anymore. That's not true. I mean, the fact that we haven't progressed on EDIS and probably regulatory requirement sovereign bond is exactly because we are still back to 10 years ago in terms of risk sharing and risk reduction. Personally, I had the hope that COVID, the next generation EU, would have sort of helped in building trust and confidence among member states and therefore it would be the basis for a renewed debate also on topics about the banking union. But I see that's not the case. Now, having said that, I have to say two points on the banking union. The first one is, I think, yes, we are focusing on EDIS, on resolution, but there is another aspect which I think has been mentioned before, which is integration in the ongoing concern basis, not just when, I mean, in the resolution phases. So I'm referring in particular on liquidity, capital movement. I mean, I live this in Unicredit. He lives in KBC. I think all cross-border banks live this. We cannot have cross-border groups and ask them to be formed and to operate efficiently if then on the other side, in their going concern, we have such a limitation to liquidity and capital. I mean, we have a single point of entry and they should be completely consistent with this also in life. And in terms of crisis management for medium institution, let me echo a little bit, Christian. I mean, I see what large banks are contributed in this moment. These are huge amounts. And what my request would be, let's make sure that the crisis management for medium banks doesn't translate into a moral hazard of medium bank versus the system, and in particular versus the larger banks. Thank you for that. And before I put my next question to Elizabeth, let me remind you in the audience that you can ask questions. We'll reserve the final half hour of this debate actually for audience questions. Elizabeth, we heard some talk about the, the, the pressures on the banking sector, the 6,000 reports at, at, uh, at, at KBC. What can the ECB do to sort of alleviate the administrative burden for banks? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think it's a common complaint that there are too many supervisory reports, um, you know, and I think it's fair also to point out where supervisors, including the ECB, might be asking for the same information in different, um, uh, different requests. So, you know, we have a whole project that's quite focused on simplification, and we're really looking carefully at making sure that we're not asking for the same information in a credit risk review about the governance process and then in the governance process asking for that same information and not making sure that we link those things up. One of the things that um, I've just taken on at the ECB is um, 
the digital agenda uh, for the SSM. And I can tell you that there's a great deal of development underway, transformation internally, if you will, across um, the users inside the ECB, but also with respect to the NCAs, there's a new project called Agora. It's a, co a collaboration tool. And the idea is that um, as the data that we're receiving is growing exponentially by the day, and this is uh, a common challenge shared by industry and by supervisors, are we able to see that we can link that data up and we can connect the dots, if you will, it will help us to be better supervisors. I think it will also help us to be far more efficient. Let's move on to uh, a different topic when we are talking about uh, operational resilience and that's technology. Uh, the emergence of big tech is clearly uh, something that is becoming very significant for banking. We see that national regulators are providing instructions to the banking sector, to the financial sector in terms of outsourcing. And what we're really talking about also is about cloud banking, about moving the, uh, uh, the data in the, bank, in, in the bank away from the old server systems towards clouds that are often externally hosted. Uh, you're addressing a number of risks. Uh, Fernando, you, you, you are very concerned about this development. Uh, why? Well, I mean, you show you that we don't have to spend that much time on, on explaining the disruption that technological de developments are creating in the, in, the, in the market for financial services. I mean, this, this has to do not only with evolution of the business models of banks themselves, but relying much on technology and outsourcing. But it's also we have new players, new providers of financial services, uh, big techs, fintechs, etc. And, and also you have the new business models like uh, you know open finance or or uh, platform-based type of, of services uh, of decentralized finance more recently, right? So you have all these uh, all these actual developments. A key aspect, which is the one you are referring to, is is actually that also technology has increased the interdependencies between providers of technological services and the banks. Uh, the most uh, popular example, of course, is the cloud, right? So cloud uh, computing services provided by technological companies to financial, to regulated institutions, in addition to other, actually, activities that those big techs perform. Could be commercial activities or the provision, the direct provision of financial services to the public. So all these things, of course, uh, basically constitutes uh, a framework in which operational risk become really important. So it's time now actually to consider what should be the approach in relation to, to those enhanced operational risks. Uh, in the past, operational resilience was actually sort of addressed by different um, pieces, regulatory pieces here and there. We had to do with risk management, with business continuity management, uh, sometimes with outsourcing as well. And now what we are seeing is that the number of uh, authorities are going in the direction of putting together a more comprehensive, a more, more holistic type of approach for operational resilience. And on that, I think, uh, two characteristics of these new frameworks, pretty much uh, in line with the Basel Committee guidance on the, on the matter, two characteristics are one is that, is that they are pretty much firms-based. So the firms themselves are the ones who should actually identify the critical functions uh, and services the ones that should actually define their own tolerance levels, the ones that should test whether they're able to meet those tolerance levels, and the ones that should actually put in place and strategy and study to ensure that uh, those tolerance levels will, be, will meet on a on a on a on a consistent on a consistent basis. And uh, well, is this, this enough? I see that the door approach in the European Union is somewhat different. It is it includes a number of more detailed, concrete rules that should actually followed by the, by the firms themselves. Although the door, as you know, focuses very much on one aspect of operational risk, which is basically ICT, ICT type of risks. The second element is that uh, the focus so far is quite micro or micro prudential. So it's about how to actually strengthen, you know, the resilience of individual banks by themselves. But uh, we probably lack a little bit actually of more comprehensive uh, overview of all interconnections between firms and technological providers of services to financial firms. I mean, just sort of hiring the services of a cloud service provider can be great for individual financial institution, can be economical, and can be effective from the point of view of operational resilience. 
But to the extent, of course, we have this, such a large concentration of CSPs, it's clear that disruption of one of the CSPs can create a huge systemic impact to the extent that basically all financial and non-financial firms, by the way, rely on the services provided by those few, actually, uh, CSPs. And that's a problem. And we don't have yet a clear framework actually to address those, those more systemic issues, although the LFSB, of course, is doing some work on, on that. Do you see a specific role for Basel when it comes to managing these risks with cloud service providers in a global context? Yeah. Because quite often you have the US context, firms. Yeah, the context, you know, what banking supervisors will, will be necessarily the ones actually looking at that. What we are seeing now is that in many jurisdictions, uh, regulators rely very much on, on the due di diligence by the firms themselves, maybe complemented by some requirements for the contracts actually to include some audit rights for the firms and for their supervisors. This is more or less the, the, the approach which is prevailing in, in most jurisdictions. A different approach is the one actually foreseen in DORA, which is quite interesting and quite ambitious. It's about actually establishing, according to your question, establishing a specific regulatory and supervisory regime for those critical providers of technological services. Even with some incredibly, actually, a stringent requirement for those critical providers of financial or technological, technological services to European firms to be incorporated actually in the European Union, which is quite, a, quite an stringent uh, approach. They are going in that direction. To me, actually, this is absolutely warranted, and this is probably the approach we should actually follow, ideally at the global level, obviously. Mm -hmm. But going now to what something you mentioned at the beginning. In any case, what we are missing, I believe, and this is what we, are, we, have, been, we have been writing about in the recent past, it's about a comprehensive, actually, sort of regulatory regime for big techs which are active in the market for financial services. Right now, big techs are obviously subject to regulation uh, to the extent that they have actually legal subsidiaries within the big tech groups which perform regulated activities. And therefore, they need a license and they have to comply with uh, different requirements, different sectoral requirements, for instance, in the area of actually operational resilience. But if you look at the big tech business model, there's a huge interconnection between the different subsidiaries performing different types of financial and non-financial services, including the cloud. They rely on common technological and data infrastructure. So it's simply this idea of going activity by activity and trying to well, monitor compliance with the sectoral requirements for each of the activities they perform does not make the trick. Like it is not sufficiently effective. You need a comprehensive, actually, sort of uh, overview, comprehensive assessment of the operational risks that the operation of big techs actually generate, take into account all of those internet interdependencies. It's what we call that we need a sort of an entity-based group-wide approach. Is that something that Basel is working on, something specifically? It's, it's something that BIS is working on right now, but basically with the purpose of facilitating a structured discussion about this important matter. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know, when you look at this from the perspective also from the, uh, uh, the, the, the Internal Controls and Risk Committee at Unicredit, uh, how is ICT risk addressed over there? Is, is, indeed, is there a need for a, a more comprehensive regulatory approach to big tech in financial services? Oh, yes. I mean, I think there is need for harmonization for harmonization of regulation in general, regulatory approaches, so GDPR, DORA, they all have to be consistent with each other in order that bank, so that banks can better operate within this framework and know what the policy is asking them to do. But then the control function need to adjust and to sort of incorporate all these new uh, challenges into their risk frameworks. And this is not that easy. I mean, I think it was mentioned also yesterday in the last panel, I think banks are doing a huge investment in this area, but they are not a very attractive point, uh, places to work, uh, even for people that are high tech specialists. I mean, salaries and uh, talent retention is an issue in these areas. Inflation is not helping in that respect because it may also exacerbate the difficulty of attracting and keeping these people. So it is a challenge, but I think they have the, first of all, the awareness that this is a, a path they have to undertake and they have to go with. I think I, I hear, I'm not a tech specialist, but I hear also my colleagues in the board are telling me clouds in itself is a very secure way of storing data and everything. So we may be worried with concentration, but it is a better system than others that we currently have. So in a way, it's a path that we have to undertake with the right attention. So maybe cybersecurity and cloud banking are actually not separate topics 
within ICT, but go no, very well together. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And it's important that it strengthens both. Uh, I wouldn't call it the first line, but it's more 1.5, we call it in Unicredit, because cybersecurity is not really first line of defense and it's not second, so it's 1.5. But then also the control function second line, they have to strengthen quite significantly. So we are relying on both of them to, for, for the way forward. Cybersecurity came up as the top three uh, risk uh, yeah. in terms of operational resilience and banking in the ECB Twitter poll. Uh, before we go back to, to Elizabeth, uh, Christian, a, a quick chance to comment on this. Do you see a bigger risk in, in, in big tech and, and the, the dependence uh, on that or in cybersecurity? Everybody here in the room knows that the, 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 at some point in time there comes a moment where it makes click and then you kind of feel you got it. Um, as far as technology risks, cyber operational risks is concerned, when Mark Branson started as the head of the German Supervisory Authority, my first meeting with him, he was sitting there and he said, Christian, for me, operational technology risks, they are just as important as microprudential topics. Now, you, he was speaking to someone that spent 10 years thinking about Basel implementation, all these things. I was kind of amazed. I was kind of thinking, how can he say that? Now, you, you might think, uh, Christian, you were rather late in understanding that. Looking back, I would agree with you. Um, especially when I spoke to US supervisors, policymakers, bankers, I always had the impression they did not want to talk anymore about microprudential things already for many years. I wanted to talk about microprudential. They wanted to talk about technology, operational risk, etc. much long before I was there. And today I'm there, and I'm glad to tell you that European banks were much faster than me realizing that, and Elena was just referring, there is a huge amount of investment attention going into that. Um, and by the way, also at the European Banking Federation, we have understood that. We have a small handful of strategic committees where we really bring together the key issues that we are focusing on. And of course, Gonzalo um, from the European Bank Federation is here. He's in charge of the micro prudential supervisory topics. We have now one for operational technology risks as well. Um, now, what, what does it mean in a European context? Um, and you also was, you were referring to outsourcing cloud, etc. We, we need to outsource banks, that's our future. Cloud is our future. We need to have frameworks where we can work in and operate properly. I'm not too sure that we have that um, sorted out yet. That's a discussion we are still having. Level playing field, looking towards technology providers, especially large technology providers. Here in Brussels, very often when it comes to legislation for technology firms, I have the impression that Brussels likes to look at the technology sector kind of as thinking there are a lot of small, only thousands of fintechs that need a lot of support here. And that is also the regulation that I see emerging a lot, is a regulation where I feel this is a regulation that should help smaller technology firms to develop. It's not really a regulation that properly captures the risk that is emerging from very large technology providers, where the question is valid to think, do they need to be supervised? Maybe similar to the way banks are looked at these days. I think that is a very important question, both from a stability as well as from a level playing field competition perspective. Um, now you were asking cyber risk, etc. When, the, when the, the war of aggression, Russia, Ukraine started, we banks were all very worried. We expected now a wave of cyber attacks coming, etc. And Andrea could report to that, but from what I gather from the European banking sector, we haven't really seen an increase there. I, look, we are all waiting, and I don't mean that in a positive sense, for the, for the big accident to happen. We have not really seen that yet, and banks are working hard to avoid that, but it is a topic that we all are quite, quite we feel we are well prepared, but we are, we are fearful of, of the risks out there, yes. At the beginning of the year, we saw financial regulators across Europe remind institutions that they need to make sure that the, the cybersecurity aspects are properly addressed, also in the Russia context. Um, when you look at the ECB, I know the ECB is also nudging and encouraging banks to make sure that those systems are properly protected. Elizabeth, are banks sufficiently resilient in the area of cybersecurity? 
Well, first of all, let me validate um, my my fellow panelists on um, the need to be focusing in on this technology aspect and the need to be focusing in on the security component, um, and also validate Christian, you, you know, your comments about Mark Branson and uh, also, you know, the, the top of mind concern that supervisors have about uh, resilience in the context of, let me just say, broadly speaking, technology, and that covers. Um, a wide variety of things. It covers the cybersecurity issues. It covers um, outsourcing arrangements. Um, it covers um, concentration issues that um, all need to be looked at in this way. Um, it's true that uh, you know our expectations going into this um, this war were uh, really raised on on uh, concerns about cyber cyber risks, and it's also true that. So far, we haven't observed an enormous uptick in cyber attacks, but that doesn't mean that we should be, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, um, complacent in any way. So we're placing a lot of importance on protection measures. Um, we're asking institutions to establish and test their response and their recovery mechanisms, and we're um, asking them to make sure that they're adapting to an evolving threat situation. So. A number of institutions engage, um, it's common, third-party providers for IT-related services and infrastructure. It's essential that they adequately manage and oversee the outsourcing arrangements that they have in place, that they have a deep understanding of the underlying risks, that they ensure ongoing service availability, and that they strengthen operational resilience. And they need to be focused also on concentration risk. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, coming from the pandemic, there was a, an institution, I won't name any institutions, obviously, but an institution that we supervised had, um, for strategic reasons, outsourced IT activities to some consultancy firms that were operating in India over the last years, and they had dedicated facilities in India. Um, and of course, um, you know, they were looking to um, use a, a lower cost environment and reduce physical and logical security risks, et cetera. But India was hit very hard by the pandemic, and there were very restrictive lockdown measures that were put in place. And of course, staff became unavailable from one day to the next, and even to the point where you couldn't reach some of these employees by phone. And the bank then had to move some of its operations back to Europe, and at the same time, relax some of its security standards to allow the staff based in India to work outside designated facilities, et cetera. So these were good responses, um, but what it led to in the end uh, was around six months of delay in the overall transformation of the bank's program. And it also meant that the bank was assuming increased security risks for more than a year. So the lesson here is about potential consequences of an over-reliance on third parties and also concentration. So I think you know, institutions are taking a harder look at concentration risk and their third party arrangements. In the area of cybersecurity, I'd also like to give you an example. And here, you know, we have strong guidelines in place already. Um, the, the guidelines that have been established by the EBA on external ICT and security risks outline some fundamental things that, um, if they are followed through, can help strengthen the resilience of an institution. Um, we did a horizontal analysis last year, and we saw that about a quarter of the banks still have gaps in the area of looking at um, their IT asset inventory. So this January, there was a major security, um, cybersecurity event that was identified. Uh, it was known as the Log4J, and it was very highly covered by the media. This vulnerability was a software flaw in a library that was extensively used for web applications and for other software. And a key step for remediating this vulnerability and mitigating the risk is to understand which systems are using that library. So what we found is a number of institutions had difficulties, significant difficulties in identifying the system. And this demonstrates why it's important to have a, a current and a complete asset inventory for timely identification of systems that become impact by known vulnerabilities. So just to, I wanted to give a couple of concrete examples of some of the risks that are out there and some of the things that banks are working on to improve resilience. Well, thank you very much for that. Very interesting. Uh, 
Now let's move on to one of my favorite topics, uh, credit risk. Uh, we see the uh, financial markets that have actually suffered quite badly so far this year. Unlike previous years, uh, lots of concern about the performance in the economy as a result of the Russia war uh, against Ukraine. We have rising inflation, uh, increasing worries over corporate earnings expectations now also becoming part of this context. And when you look at the, uh, the poll, the Twitter poll by the ECB, credit risk emerged clearly with 40% of the voters as the, the top risk for the, the banking sector in terms of uh, resilience. Now, we saw during the COVID pandemic that uh, bankruptcies actually did not exist uh, because of all the support to the economy from the, the government programs, the, uh, uh, the conducive behavior also by the, uh, in terms of monetary policy by the central bank. And you can imagine that uh, we're moving into a completely different scenario. Are banks prepared for a new rise in bankruptcies, uh, a new rise maybe in non-performing loans, uh, the context of uh, increasing challenges in terms of uh, counterparty credit risk, credit risk in general? Fernando, can I ask you about that? I guess probably the, the panel is Elizabeth, the one uh, who could be in a better position just basically to speak about what is the situation of banks themselves. I basically agree very much the way you describe the situation. We were all quite concerned about, uh, about, about the impact of the discontinuation of the support measures, how this would affect actually the quality of banks' uh, portfolio. So far, what we, we see is that there is no, no much of a problem there. I mean, I was speaking to a banker last time, uh, I mean, uh, last week, and he was telling me actually that uh, the, the default rates, actually, for those loans that were subject to this sort of uh, moratoria, and now they are going back to the normal calendar, are exactly actually the same as the other, other loans which are not, not, were not subject to this. So basically, no impact so far. Um, where there is something hidden, it's hard to say, certainly it's hard to say for me. Maybe Elizabeth has a different view about, about that. In, but this clear in any case is that these important support measures have worked to bridge this very specific situation, very concentrated in time. That is clear. And that's contributed massively, actually, to keep uh, both economic and financial stability. That said, my main concern now is probably about the implications of those support measures on the sustainability of public finances in European countries that, in a context of higher interest rates, is obviously contributing to these signs of fragmentation that we are observing. And that's obviously the main risk that we have to face now at the macro level. But eventually, of course, this could have implications for, for, for banks themselves. I don't know, do you see credit risk as something that could cause trouble in the future? Well, I mean, of course, is the answer. But I think now we are at a level of uncertainty uh, still. As Fernando said, we have not seen that much so far. That is a bit difficult to predict. But let me say there are pros and cons. The pros is that the credit risk, differently from cyber risk, is the core of banking and the core of banking risks. So in a way, risk management framework and also capacity within banks to deal with credit risk are certainly there. And therefore, from this perspective, they are better equipped. The banks are better equipped. Now, having said that, this is a different type of credit risk. It's a little bit similar to the one we saw with COVID. And why am I saying that? Because normally credit risk is, I mean, the assessment and the management is based on time series, past information. But with the COVID, we already learned that what is really important is more forward-looking analysis, because these are exogenous shocks that come into the system in a way that past credit worthiness is not an indicator necessarily of future credit worthiness. So what our banks are required to do is really to develop this forward-looking analysis that they have already been doing during the COVID pandemic, but there it was more a sector analysis, if you want, and now it's almost name-by-name -name analysis. So the challenge is going even more granular than in the past with the credit analysis. And that, I think, is a challenge. Now, if we look at direct exposure of the banking sector towards a sector or companies that rely massively on energy, I think I saw ECB studies recently showing that direct exposure is less than 2%, so it's very little. But of course, what's very difficult is to estimate the indirect exposure and the indirect effect that may come from it. And here, granularity, again, is essential. And 
let me just, I was looking recently at an OECD study that I found very interesting. It was a study on the impact of uh, energy costs on individuals. And it was very interesting to see how granular it was going. So they were dividing between home energy costs and transport energy costs. They were dividing between middle, high, and low income households, living in rural area or living in metropolitan city. Because of course, all these elements impact enormously on the impact that increased energy costs will have on the household. So this is just an example of granularity that we are having. Christian, when we go back to the crisis in 2007, 2008, um, the European sector, the European economy wasn't really as exposed until it became clear that the domino effect from the Lehman collapse would affect the European banking sector. And that's ultimately, when you trace it down in history, that's what triggered banking union uh, as a response uh, in terms of policy here in Europe. Uh, that was an unexpected crisis. People now getting worried about the economy, about getting credit risk possibly collapses uh, down the line somewhere, uh, more talk about recession in the US. Is that, how, how is the banking sector taking in that risk? 2007, 2008, that is very far behind us and we have a very fundamental difference here. Banks have more than doubled their capital ratio. That was quite a painful path, but it was the right way to go. And that is, and I will come to that in a second, but I would say that you asked Fernando, are banks well prepared? I could al always ask back, well prepared for what? Right? We could think of very different scenario here. But I would say as far as kind of even what the ECB would call a worst case scenario in a stress test world, banks are prepared. Um, you, kind of your question, um, credit risk, macro, there are two dimensions for me to answer that. Um, and let me start with the question on stability. I want to be very clear, the challenges here are, first of all, unlike in the financial crisis, a challenge for our clients. Um, and this, this situation is very difficult because it's a number of different crises that are actually interconnected, lying on top of each other. Um, and I could think of inflation here, global supply chains there, etc. cetera. Um, it, it's a very complex situation if you look at it from the perspective of a risk manager in a bank when he looks at, at his clients right now. Um, Elena said we have learned a lot from the pandemic, that's right, but the situation now is in one aspect fundamentally different. Um, the pandemic always was clear to all of us, it's temporary. Yeah. So we had to answer a question, how do we get through this dip? Now, I, when I even speak to some of my banks on European levels, I get answers that are the right answers to facts to fix something that is temporary. We could discuss with supervisors, do we need more moratoria, etc. cetera. Um, but we all know the situation now is not temporary. We're going to stick with high energy prices and all that entails for quite a while. That is why we need different answers now than we had to give um, during the pandemic, a pandemic that we are not over with now. But my, my main message is here, banks are prepared to cope from a financial stability perspective, what we would call a worst case scenario out there. But of course, if we would stop all Russian gas supplies from our side, from the Russian side today, uh, things could get worse and then we need to revisit that situation. I would like to put also, um, um, take a, take a, spend a few sentences on the second dimension here. And um, the challenge is not only to manage risks and stability, the challenge also is that banks are, there are high expectations on the role banks now have to fulfill to fund the economy. Why am I bringing up that point? Because all the challenges, all the risks we are talk about today, they at the end, and it is counterintuitive, counterintuitive, but if there is one prognosis for me for the decade ahead, it will be a decade of investment. We need to sort out our global supply chains. We need to sort out how to stop climate change, etc. So uh, credit risk challenges, but at the same time, banks are under huge pressure to fund finance. the economy, to finance the economy. Um, and now we could, all of us, we could come up with different numbers, etc. Um, now banks have done well during the pandemic to be at the side of their clients, to fund them throughout the pandemic years. Um, I cannot sit here and be as confident 
as I was during the pandemic for the challenges that I had. I'm very confident as far as stability is concerned. Banks will always be able to fulfill their capital ratios, etc. But are banks today well prepared to um, cope with the funding challenge ahead? I'm not so sure. I see that bank capital to respond to client needs is already a shortage today, and we have not even seen the big funding needs coming our way. In Germany, I see a lot of funding needs coming from the restructuring of supply chains, yeah. because a lot of even SMEs now, we might not like that, but they have understood that they need to relocate production facilities into the EU, maybe even to Germany, and they go to their bank and say, I need funding for that investment. Um, and for banks, it's not very easy um, today to respond all to all these funding needs. So when we talk about credit risk, the challenge that we need to get right here is, yes, we want to have a fin stable financial system. I want to have a stable financial system. But we also need to be able, in this crisis we have, to provide funding. Now, I understand that when I speak to supervisors, their incentive is to make sure that there is sufficient capital for stability. And then I speak to politicians, and they, it's, it's their role to voice that there is sufficient capability and capital available that banks can fulfill these expectations as far as funding is concerned. We are, we are more at the beginning of this debate than at the end of this debate. Very important point you're making, Christian, on the need to finance the transition. The transition, of course, in terms of energy sources, but also in terms of climate change. And that requires significant investments. We need capital markets union for that as well, of course. But when you look at that need, uh, Elizabeth, in, in, in the context of the current economy, banking supervision, the whole system that we have in Europe, banking union very much is focused on financial stability. Do you see much room to let banks actually uh, finance that transition? And, and basically the question is, uh, how is the ECB from the Euro Tower, the ECB supervisors, how are you viewing this economic change that we are seeing with inflation, uh, possibly a recession? Thank you for the question. Um, uh, and uh, again, I'm going to find myself agreeing very much with my fellow panelists on the different risks that they see out there. But I want to, I want to maybe bring a little bit of a sharper focus on a couple of the issues. And it's, it's right to draw the trajectory from the pandemic and the credit risk scenario that we saw in the pandemic and um, you know how very well managed this picture really is as we look at um, the balance sheets of banks. We benefited tremendously from global cooperation, from fiscal supports, monetary policy supports, supervisory measures um, that really allowed for that temporary situation to be managed in, uh, in quite, a, uh, quite an excellent way with far fewer bankruptcies existing now than I think any of us would have predicted at the outset. Fast forward to today, where we're facing um, an exogenous shock um, in the form of the war that is also um, exacerbating the continued supply chain issues that were already there from the pandemic. And lay that against uh, the macro picture that I think we need to really be focused in on, which is um, the banking environment has changed quite dramatically. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, we have um, you know, a situation where the shadow banking uh, market has grown exponentially in the last decade. We see um, new entrants into the lending uh, to the overall economy that exists. Um, we see that in, in not an insignificant way. Uh, there, there is a tremendous shift to lending uh, that's taking place to the overall market from private equity, for example. And one of the concerns, and I would say significant concerns that um, I would personally have is about um, what the impact of that is on the overall credit quality um, in, in borrowers. So for example, the leverage finance market has also grown um, exponentially in the last decade. And you're seeing that um, there's a, a huge shift toward what's called covenant light. Um, but even more than covenant light, a concern that um, I would raise is about the negative pledge that is now um, 
de facto a market component driven by the private equity firms where leveraged borrowers previously had constraints on their uh, borrowing capacity imposed by affirmative covenants by the banks that they wouldn't borrow above a certain threshold. Well, the private equity firms have um, made a requirement that that be dropped. So now do we have complete line of sight into what the overall leveraged ratios look like? Do we, do we understand um, very clearly what risk exists in that, in that marketplace? Um, all of this piece is happening, of course, um, in a market that's marked by a constellation of risks. I mentioned the supply chain. My colleagues on the panel have mentioned the rising energy costs, the derivative impacts that that has on manufacturing and business and what will occur there. And of course, you know, concerns about um, the flow of gas being reduced quite tremendously. What will be the impact of that on an overall basis? So we continue to have um, concerns about counterparty credit risk in a wide variety of ways. Um, and I think uh, you know, it's really important that we make sure that institutions do have that name by name look through credit analysis and very strong credit risk management processes in place in the banks. Now you also ask about um, you know, the transition. And it's, it's of course the case that there's gotta be a pivot in Europe to um, other types of energy that may not be so climate friendly in the very near term. But in the longer term, what this brings into very sharp relief is the need for um, Europe to move its climate agenda ahead even more quickly. And it's also true, Christian is saying this, that the funding needs that are there are, are going to grow exponential, not only in the area of financing the transition to um, for climate change, but also in, in the funding needs that are necessary for technology transformation. So it's, it's um, you know, we're very fortunate that we entered into the pandemic um, because of the great efforts of uh, folks that came before me to um, strengthen the capital ratios in the institutions to strengthen the risk management practices in the bank and to put the banks on a, on a very sound financial footing going into the pandemic. It's gonna be very important that we continue that strength so we have sustainable ability to fund the economy on a going forward basis. And we have to be very cognizant of some deepening risks that exist out there. Elizabeth, when you mention concern at the ECB over this counterparty credit risk in this current context, should we expect any specific steps from ECB supervisors towards banks on this? I think you will hear us continue on a bank by bank basis to be very actively engaged in dialogue with the institutions to um, improve their risk management practices. Thank you, Christian. Do you mind Ramon, if I just quickly one thought on what um, Elizabeth said on leverage lending, because it's a good example on the, how difficult it is to get the balance right between stability on the one hand and banks' ability to fund the economy. Um, that the ECB looks at classical leverage finance, PE-driven transactions, I understand. Now, if the ECB comes up with a definition of leverage finance that suddenly not only captures PE-driven transactions, but... That is, in a way, so we like clear and simple routes, but they are, if they are so simple that suddenly a large part of the European corporate world falls under leverage finance, companies that have received, for example, um, state lending, state support measures in the pandemic. Um, now, if, if I use, look at the ECB definition of leverage finance and I see how that applies to the client world, I, I find a long list of com companies, corporates, that have nothing to do with traditional leverage finance. Um, for me, what Elizabeth, and she brought that up, is, is a good example where the, which shows that the question of stability on the one hand and ability to provide funding to pretty ordinary European corporates is not an, it's not an easy task. Does the ECB need to look at different factors to assess leverage? About, um, the ECB knows that, and we European banks talk to them a lot about that as far as leverage finance is concerned. We, we think they should take a different approach there. I think if, I, if I may, I think this is, a cons this is a discussion on the definition of leverage transaction that I also hear a lot internally uh, in the bank. And I do agree with, uh, with Christian. I think the ECB should make clear what a leverage transaction is and possibly go for a definition 
that doesn't incorporate also lending to highly indebted corporates, because otherwise it, it's really becoming, I mean, I speak now countries like Italy, but also as a result of the pandemic. I mean, we know that corporate indebtedness has increased. If we now incorporate that into the definition of leverage transaction, we really risk to cut a big part of the corporates from what banks can, be do, can do. So that is an issue that I know Andrea personally is very concerned with, that it's very dear to him, the definition of a ledger transaction. But I think it's an area where indeed what Christian is saying between stability and on the other hand, lending and supporting the economy is the core. And I, I, I think there is scope for some clarification at least of what we really mean with the leverage transaction. Very interesting to hear this. I also see this in my work in covering the asset management industry. And asset managers are looking at their investments, their portfolios, and they're saying the traditional rules for assessing corporates do not apply anymore. We are in a completely new constellation where you need to look at different, different factors, different ratios than what you've looked at in the past. Fernando, I see you're taking notes, but it seems to me that we may be facing a risk that we are driving into the future and looking into the rearview mirror. Should it be otherwise? I mean, so basically we have to set a look at the future, look at the challenges that the financial industry has to face, the contribution that the financial industry should actually make to the huge transformation of the economy. But, uh, let's not forget about the, you know, the experience that how relevant it is to keep actually some financial system, that at the end of the day, there is no real trade-off between the stability and, uh, and the continuation of credit flows to the, to the real economy. That of course, there could be some adjustments here and there, that, uh, that obviously some, could be some disproportionate requirements that could actually have unintended effects. Supervisors, international sensitive bodies are continuously reviewing actually those rules to see whether these unintended effects are relevant or not. But let's not accept as a proposition that there is a trade-off actually that we have to face. There is no way in which the banking sector can contribute to the real economy. It certainly it faces some difficulties to remain stable and sound. I want to go back to Elizabeth uh, one more time on these issues. Uh, because from what I understand from Elena and, and, and Christian here is that it sounds almost as if the cockpit screen in the, uh, in the plane that the ECB is driving is a little bit outdated. Elizabeth, would you agree with such an assessment? I wouldn't agree that it's outdated, not, not at all. Um, and I think in a way we're all in this together and Fernando is exactly right. Um, I don't think there's a trade-off at all between sound credit risk management and financial stability and ensuring that institutions are there for lending to the overall economy. And you use the phrase rear view mirror, and I could only um, smile a little bit about that because um, of course, we always need to be taking on board the lessons of history. And the last time that we allowed leveraged finance to grow in an uncontrolled way in the subprime crisis, well, we all know what happened. So I think what is um, extremely important is to be exquisitely um, clear about a changing market environment, about understanding that um, lending to institution, lending to borrowers that are not going to be able to pay at the end of the day um, is something that um, is only going to hurt the overall economy, just to speak very simply. Thanks for that. Uh, Can I make another example? Sure. <laughs> because um, Fernando says there is no conflict between stability and ability to lend. And leave the ECB aside for a moment, look now in a national context, macroprudential supervision. Um, I'm talking about Germany, we have just activated, it's going to be really put into force only next year, but there is a counter-cyclical couple buffer and a sector-specific measure for the real estate market. 2% additional capital requirements for real estate lending. Now, what world are we living in at the moment? We see that because of inflation, house prices stay where they are, extremely high. And we live in, an, in a world where interest rates rise. And because of the sector-specific measure for real estate residential lending in Germany, their rise particularly the, the increase is particularly strong for residential real estate. Now, what is happening in a world where buying real estate is super expensive already? And in the past years, normal people had access to purchasing real estate because financing was low. Now suddenly you have 
not only high prices, but you have prohibitive high financing costs. Um, and that excludes large parts of the population, the Mittelstand, from acquiring real estate. Now, I would call there is a conflict here. No, no. I mean, policy is about conflicts and trade-offs and compromises you have to make to make different objectives. That's clear. I'm not saying that there is no trade-offs at all in policy action. Quite the contrary. It's actually, you know, sort of day-to-day -day business actually for policymakers. I was referring to something very concrete. And I qualify my statement saying something like over the, long, over the medium term, principle, there should be no trade-off between financial stability and sort of adequate flow of credit to the real economy. Because an unstable financial system is unable like, to support the real economy on a sustainable basis. The example you were referring to is a different thing. And this is a very interesting one. Right? Which is, you have a macroprudential tool. By the way, this the macroprudential tool, some micro, macroprudential tool that certainly affair, affect the affordability of housing for some segments of the population are particularly effective, actually, in order to moderate, so disorderly, actually, developments in, in, in credit or in housing prices. We know that. And it's, I think it's a good lesson, again, with your rear uh, mirror, a good lesson, actually, from the, from the crisis. In my own country, in other countries, right? So we have a huge credit boom, huge housing price boom that uh, they, you know, the disorderly sort of correction of that just to trigger the disastrous, actually, financial instability episode. So we have identified a number of macro potential tools that could be helpful in, in particular to prevent those episodes and, there, and therefore to preserve financial stability. Does it mean that it's a completely free lunch? Of course not. Of course not. At the end of the day, because you introduce this type of measures, certain skills, as you said, that could, could affect the affordability of housing for some segments of the population. What is the response to that? Well, you have two objectives, find a second instrument. But let's not compromise, actually, the, you know, the application of helpful, effective macro potential tools to preserve financial stability, which is a hugely important public good, I think. Mm -hmm. May I just add the one comment? Sure, then. I think, uh, I mean, if I now take my academic hat for a moment, I think, I mean, in order that there is that trade-off between financial stability and growth, I mean, in normal times, we should see financial stability as almost an intermediate objective to foster growth. So in a way, it's true, there shouldn't be any, um, any trade-off between financial stability and growth. Having said that, the reality is a bit different and depends also a little bit on what economic condition one has. So macroprudential tools are normally introduced in times of booms of exuberance. And therefore, the support to the economy is different than the situation where we, as we have now, where inflation, for example, is supply-driven, is not demand-driven. So here we don't really have an exuberance in terms of economy. So in this situation, I think the trade-off may be a little bit more subtle in a sense. Here we're in a situation where, on the one end, we want to keep the financial system stable, but on the other hand, the economy is not in a boom moment, or at least it was a little bit, and now we are starting again into less of a boom situation, to be optimistic. So that, I think the trade-off is a bit different. So here is a situation where regulation also should maybe sit back a little bit and think, okay, how am I still pursuing financial stability, but not in an excessive manner, because indeed the support to the economy may be more relevant than when we are introducing a macro pro where there is exuberance. So it's a bit different, the situation. I think we have to put it in context. Yeah. So that, I like the way you put the, actually the, the issue, frankly. And also it, it, uh, it uh, allows us actually to discuss something which I think is relevant. We have actually faced the pandemic shock in particular, right? So the new regulatory framework put in place after the great financial crisis has been tested. Uh, this new regulatory framework introduced important reforms on the micro potential domain, is the Basel III, so on. Certainly the resolution domain is the sort of new resolution framework that has been put in place at the global level, but also macro potential framework for the first time. So sort of sensible reflection here is about whether that macro potential framework has worked as expected. And we have some interesting lessons. We don't have time to cover them in full some interesting lessons. Uh, for instance, in terms of those macroprudential buffers, you mentioned the counter capital buffer before, capital conservation buffer, etc. Have they worked as we expected them to work? And the answer is probably not quite. And something has to be done in order to actually sort of mitigate the type of conflicts that you were referring to. So yeah. accumulate actually buffers in good times 
then release them in, in bad times in order to maintain your normal flows of credit to the real economy. And that's the way you should actually sort of approach this trade off. It will exist, but you have actually the possibility to design tools in order to cope with, with it. And there is something to be reflected on that, of course. And the buffers, of course, to a certain extent, are there already in the banking union. Um, I'd like to bring in a, a related question from the audience, maybe not completely on this, this interesting uh, tension, field of tension, but uh, it's a question to, uh, to Christian. Um, we must indeed invest, but on so many fronts. Does the banking sector have the capacity to cover it all? Do we need priorities? The banking sector has the ambition to be on the side of our clients and to fulfill all these funding needs. And really, they're substantial. The Commission thinks 400 billion per year for fighting climate change. Um, and I mentioned to you kind of the restructuring of uh, global supply chains from uh, the, this moving away from just in time to just in case. It's not sustainable. So there, there is a lot going on. Now, I, I could, a very senior German banking supervisor, this time not from BaFin, but the most senior Bundesbank, he kind of talks to me regularly and he says, oh, you know, I doubt the bank's ability to really deliver on funding that. And he says, we need to more look more at the non-banking sector, etc. And I'm, I'm very unhappy with um, it brings me back to Fernando and, and Elena. Your, your answer was perfect, kind of looking at what is the link between um, stability and growth, etc. Um, right now, I feel left, right, and center this conflict. Also, when a banking supervisor looks at me and says, Oh, um, you banks, you cannot really properly, adequately respond to all these needs there. That's why we need to look at more the ability of the non banking sector. Um, and I would. I'm, you, you, you can imagine how I feel about that because I'm kind of thinking um, well, now the banking supervisor kind of this is shadow banks, right? The, the activity that should be regulated has moved to some other lenders and the supervisor kind of thinks about how can we better mobilize them. I would like the supervisor to think how he can better enable banks. And if I may leave one thought with you, Fernando, the real estate sector in Germany never experienced any crisis. So we are now killing and it's also a social question here. We are restricting access of the vast majority of the population to buying real estate. That is bringing a lot of other political risk also with it that we need to take into account in order to preserve something that I understand from a supervisor's perspective is good, which means always more capital in a bank's balance sheet. Would it help the European banking sector if the policymakers in Brussels would step up capital markets union, because that's also designed to increase diversity in the funding landscape in Europe. Everybody here in the room would agree capital markets union is an answer to a lot of the challenges we are facing, but we also know that we talk about capital market union for decades. There has been very pro little progress, and that is not because policymakers don't get it, but because that is because progress is difficult. My advice would be, and I'm not a policymaker, and um, uh, that, that is sometimes easier than being one. My advice would be let's focus on things where we really can make a big progress, but that are also feasible. Harmonizing insolvency frameworks in Europe, that is quite a challenging task. It's going to take many years. Um, securitization, that is the one area where I would say let's make sure we get that solved properly. We haven't done so in the past. I also understand that from a parliament's political perspective, just the term securitization on the back of the crisis is a difficult one. And if I sit here now and explain the world that it's actually synthetic securitization that is a real solution, then I know that in the European Parliament, I'm not going to get a lot of applause for that. But frankly, when we talk about capital markets union, let's be pragmatic. Let's focus on what's feasible, what has a huge impact. A lot of what we discuss now has to do, has to do with capital. So let's try to get assets off banks' balance sheets. Let's create investable assets for investors that live in an inflation world, right? Um, let's create a really practical, competitive securitization framework in Europe. What we have right now is not up to this. Elena, do you see room for the EU to accelerate capital markets union? <laughs> Well, if we have to judge as well, we are making progress in the banking union. I wouldn't but be let that me ask it, in, the, in this new geopolitical context that we find ourselves, is, is, is that a new window of opportunity? 
Well, perhaps. I mean, we, we also discussed yesterday, you know, Europe advances when there are crises. And uh, I mean, for example, during COVID, I think we have made a huge, uh, huge increases and improvement in terms of cooperation. So possibly, yes. I mean, possibly Europe will realize that now the needs are such that we need the further progress in capital market union. Now we are, we have about 10 minutes to go and I mentioned the poll several times throughout the discussion and it actually was the results of the ECB Twitter poll, but we've had our own poll running out in the, in the last hour and I understand from the team, I have a message on the iPad here that that poll is ready. Now let's see what the, uh, the audience response to that poll was. In which area do you feel banks are least resistant? And that's... The red one, the economic context is a challenge, and then climate change and sustainable finance. And then we have a second question on which area do you feel the banks are most resistant? Yeah. And again, but <laughs> with fewer votes, <laughs> this, the economic the context. context you know? And interesting to see here compliance and AML, uh, anti money laundering and KYC <laughs> as something that banks have invested in quite, quite a bit. Now, uh, indeed, the economic context is, is also flagged by the audience in the poll as something that is very important. I'd like to do a final tour de table uh, and, and feel free to also bring in any, any elements that have not yet been discussed um, so far. And I want to start with, with you, Fernando. Well, we have covered much ground, probably too much. Yeah? So we couldn't get in really deep into a specific issues. But let me just go back to... Um, let me just go back to, to the very first issue we discussed, which is about actually the banking union, uh, what the prospects actually is to, to improve the, the banking union, to complete and improve the banking union. I think I think it was Elena saying, and I pretty much sympathize with what you said when said that, well, uh, we have been actually a number of years discussing this issue. I sit here, I listen to the arguments, they are not very different to the ones actually I could hear so many, many years ago. And you're absolutely right. In the area of improving the crisis management framework in Europe, it's very clear, right? I mean, we started discussing these issues about, uh, you know, the mid-sized banks and about actually the lack of uh, an ADs and the need actually to, uh, to put in place actually mechanisms to deal with uh, the crisis of different types of banks already for many years and actually don't find new ideas. But if I want to be positive, and I want to be positive uh, for once now, um, we have achieved something, which is there is now relatively, relative, relative consensus on the issues. So we know what are the problems. Not only that, I see also that there are some sort of ideas of what should be actually sort of the main reference in order to solve some of the issues that we have identified on which we agree. For instance, I think it was Elke mentioning yesterday at some point that uh, some years ago, the people who, who were actually involved in the analysis of the th this type of situation, the failures, the flaws of the crisis management economy in Europe, hesitated very much to use the term, we have to go in the direction of un European FDIC. This is no longer the case. I mean, now the term European FDIC is actually used by everyone, which is great because I mean, European FDIC is basically sort of the list of ingredients that you are able to develop could actually help sort of solve you know, some of the issues that we are looking at in, in Europe. So the good positive uh, side of all this is precisely that. Some agreement on diagnosis and some agreement on some, some of the elements of a solution, which is something. My main pr problem is that as we are making this relatively moderate progress, I mean, time is running out. That we have this tension in the public debt markets. That the risk of more fragmentation, the risk of an eventual reactivation or the feedback loop between the sovereign and banks all those risks are now more significant than some years ago. And the issue, of course, whether actually we have, we have the luxury just to wait to get additional concrete progress in implementing the solutions, and not only about sort of agreeing analytically on what the problems we need to solve. Hmm? So clear awareness needed on the fact that time is limited, time is limited. for us. Elena, your final thoughts? Well, there are, I, mean, there, I mean, there are many aspects that we haven't touched. One is clear, but let me put it under one umbrella, which is I think it's important that both banks and the regulators have as much clarity as possible on whatever we are discussing. We didn't touch much, but one area is, for example, climate risk. That's an area where banks are required to do a lot of things, 
but there are again these differences between what's the role of banks, and possibly there shouldn't be any, but what's the role of bank in fostering investment, and in particular energy transition, and on the other hand, what's the role of banks in risk managing, I mean, in managing the risk related to climate and the environment. And there, I think there has to be clarity as to what the regulation is coming up, and there has to be also, if you want, flexibility from a regulator and supervisor in terms of understanding the situation now may not be the same as it was three months ago. So what banks should be doing now and how we think about gas uh, or even coal may be different from how we were thinking about this a few months ago. So the first point is clarity from the regulator and supervisory perspective as much as possible. Second, I think banks want to be guided. So when you said before to Christian, do we have priorities in what banks should be doing? I think banks need guide a little bit, guidance as to what they should be doing. And I think one aspect that the supervisor may be doing that would be very useful for banks is to share best practices as much as possible. So to make clear that banks understand the expectation, but really concretely, not just in more general terms, because banks would, I think, then invest in the right direction. I mean, knowing already what is the best practice. And it's not just a matter of avoiding bad practices or worse practices. It's really trying to give incentives to the banks to become always better in whatever they do, governance, risk management, business model, whatever they do. And finally, we heard before the ban to dividends. I mean, we were in a situation in the pandemic where we had so much uncertainty that it was very different to differentiate across banks. And this is why, I mean, this was one of the motivations why we had the dividend bans. Now we are still in a situation of high uncertainty, possibly different, possibly even worse. But to some extent, I think it would be important to distinguish across banks, and not, not to make all banks look alike, because ultimately we want the champions, we want the banking sector to remain strong. And if we, maybe for, you know, for, uh, for excessive prudence or for uh, uncertainty reason, we tend to penalize even the better ones, then we risk to homogenize the system to a stand, which wouldn't be optimal in my view. Christian, would you take guidance from the ECB on where to invest? No, not on where to invest. Well, oh. <laughs> this is not on, on, on best practices. Uh, oh, on best yeah. practices. Yeah. Take a lot of guidance from ECB, very smart people and very um, challenging, but, but, but the di as I said, the dialogue is highly valued as an association, but mostly I get that from our banks. Um, very quickly, the, the poll, there were a couple of things that we did not discuss. One couple of things that surprised me, well, surprised me, I liked to see that people believe ML risk is something that banks control really nicely. Um, and I hope that the audience is right. I see banks making a lot of effort. Um, ri ba risks that banks do not control after the economic macro topics Climate, July 8, um, Elizabeth, Andrea, and the team, they're going to present the climate stress test um, of the ECB. Um, I, I, my expectation is a bottom line, and why, what is it based on? We have seen Bank of England presenting their results. The material risks are not so high coming from climate stresses. It's an important exercise that we do. The ECB always says it's learning together, and yes, we are learning together. Um, I would be very surprised if we see kind of in terms of materiality something that would confirm this poll, like saying climate risk is an issue that could bring the banking sector to its knees. We have not seen that with the Bank of England. I don't see that with my banks. I would surprise if the ECB would see that. And by the way, the comments that we have heard, I think it was two days ago from Frank Alderson on the climate stress test would confirm that. I, I think the headline was... Banks have made a lot of progress. He probably wouldn't stay that if the ECB would believe it is one of the major risks that might bring the banking sector to its knees. Um, dividend ban, we had long discussions with the ECB on this back then. Also there, the dialogue was very good. The ECB came about with restrictions and the banking sector said it's the wrong tool. I don't think that's a tool that is at all on the table in the current environment. I would hope so. My last point, and that is not new, that's going back to the beginning. Europe, market integration. Elena said before, Europe is strong in times of crisis. That was my expectations four months ago. Sean Berrigan, coming back from the discussions of the first sanction package, he said, Christian, great momentum. Europe, on a very difficult topic, is showing ability to act. And 
high hopes that this ability to act we might transpose to other fields like banking union, financial integration. Four months later, um, in our field, Europe has proven no ability to act whatsoever. Um, big disappointment. Fernando said before, oh, we lack these cross-border banks. My answer to that is very simple. There is no rationale today for banks to be active in a cross-border context. You can run separate institution with one supervisor, but the, the scale economies of scale are very limited. It's not a new topic in terms of our debate today, but we need to make that our top priority, I find. Elizabeth, final thoughts from you? I think there's plenty to connect to. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is, um, you know, and I'm summing up this this panel that we're in this, this very broad ranging discussion. The first point is banks are resilient. Um, there are a number of reasons why that's the case. There was a tremendous coordination and cooperation across all of the different sectors of, of uh, the overall government structure globally and the banks themselves and what they have done to strengthen their balance sheets. Um, we're in a situation where the banks are resilient. The second point is um, I have this uh, little bit of a sense of history um, here as we think about what the constellation of risks looks like. Um, and it feels very uncertain. Um, you know, there are a number of indicators there that are telling us that the risk situation in the overall global marketplace is um, at a heightened level, um, so heightened that we probably haven't seen this, this level of risk that is developing out there in quite some time. So it means that we need to be very vigilant about risk management processes, um, financial stability, and ensuring that the institutions remain resilient. Um, the third point I'd like to make is, um, I'd like to strongly add my voice to everyone here um, in expressing extreme disappointment on the lack of progress on the banking union. I had the sense when, um, you know, four months ago, when uh, this war broke out that, and, and watching um, history taking place with a, um, a unifying element occurring across Europe in a way that no one could have predicted. Everyone would have thought it would take decades to bring about this level of unification. I expected that that level of unification would translate into deepening the banking union and setting up the structures that we need to make sure that we have a safer and sounder European banking system, to make sure that cross-border can take place, to make sure that we have a safety net of an EDIS in place, and to make sure that we have a strengthened capital markets union. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I, um, I urge all of those who have a voice to continue to work on that, because as Fernando said, um, it's 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 extremely important at this uncertain moment, which is characterized by so much risk. Um, the last point, and it's a much smaller point, and it's just about the securitization market. Um, I recently saw a statistic out there. In 2008, uh, I think, and including the UK, 75% um, the, the the European securitization market was 75% of that of the US. In 2020, with the same statistic, it is 6%. Um, securitization, if appropriate significant risk transfer takes place, can be a, uh, a, a a way of mitigating risk on the balance sheets of the banks, a very powerful way. You can homogenize the risk and you can distribute it to an overall marketplace. And uh, development in that area would also help us quite a lot in this moment of incredible um, storm gathering clouds. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And thank you very much, everybody else in the panels for a fascinating discussion. Um, I hand it back to Susan.